Hi, my name is Stephen Fluin, and this is Demos with Angular. Today we're going to take a look at a very simple Angular application. An Angular application that's scaffolded out with the CLI command ng-new dash dash service worker. What this does is it takes a basic application and adds in service worker capabilities. We'll take a look at the different caching options, how we register the service worker only in production mode, and then we'll take a look at some of the additional capabilities provided by the Angular service worker. The Angular service worker is really nice in the way that it gives you access to update events that are coming from the service worker so that you can understand and respond to changes in the service worker lifecycle, as well as looking at how we can do push notifications using our service worker under the hood. Let's get started. All right, to get started, what we're going to do is we're going to jump into the terminal here, and I'm going to create a brand new Angular application using the Angular CLI. Uh, and I'm going to use a special flag called dash dash service dash worker. And so this will create a normal Angular application just like we'd expect. So we'll be able to wait for that in the background here. Uh, and then let's try and open up VS Code alongside it. So if we take a look at the project structure that the CLI has scaffolded out, we're going to see a normal files that we'd expect, source folder, app folder. Uh, and then there's going to be two things I want to point out. Uh, we've got an ngsw config file here uh, where we have all of the service worker config. And then if we jump into the app folder, we will also see our app module uh, has this nice service worker module already imported for us. So the service worker configuration is where we're going to set all of the uh, config. How do we want to cache our files? And our app module uh, is where we're actually going to be enabling the service worker, but only for production mode. That's actually very important because it breaks developer experience as we'll, we'll see in a couple minutes. Uh, the service worker config has kind of two parts. It's got asset groups and it's got data groups. Asset groups are for managing how you handle all of the files in your application uh, and data groups are for you ha how you handle remote data. So let's go ahead and ng serve this and make sure that this application is working out of the box. And it is. So we here have a standard Angular CLI application, uh, but because it was built with service worker and that service worker flag, uh, as soon as we do a dash dash prod build, uh, we'll end up seeing the service worker. Um, if you're looking for more information about the specific configuration, uh, Angular IO has a really great guide that breaks down all of the options you can do. So if you look at the asset groups and whether you want to be uh, prefetching it as part of the install or lazily when it's required, uh, it's definitely capable of that. <laughs> Uh, and then the data groups, you can actually do a much uh, higher degree of control over what you're caching, when you're caching. Uh, do you want to be network first and be as uh, fresh as possible? Or do you want to be uh, performance first and be as performant as possible? So all of those things end up in your ngsw config.json file. So now to interact with our service worker, we're going to use a constructor here, and we're going to use the dependency injection system to get access to uh, SW update, which is the uh, status of the update process from the service worker. And we're going to use SW push, uh, both from the Angular service worker package. Uh, SW push is what gives us access to push notifications. So if I look at the update, I've got a couple options here, but the one we care about is available, and I'm going to subscribe to that. Uh, and then uh, we'll be taking whatever update is given to us. This this is only going to be emitted once there's an update available to our service worker. So after it's been detected, installed by the browser, uh, and then available to our application to apply. So normally a user would have to unload the service worker and then reload their application to see it. Uh, but we want to give the user the option to kind of trigger this automatically. And so uh, I want to give these things in a nice way beyond just what's available in console.log. So I'm going to install Angular Material and the CDK. Uh, so we can have a nice snack bar to present all this to the user. All right, while the CLI is installing that in the background, I'm going to go ahead and start adding in our imports. Uh, so there's two things we're going to need. We're going to need to import the snack bar module from the at angular slash material package. Uh, so it's Matt snack bar module uh, with a capital S and a capital B. So uh, don't make the same mistake I'm making right now. Um, so snack capital S capital B uh, and it, even if it's, uh, if it's installed, this will work. Uh, and then we're going to go ahead and add that. Oh, and now I need to install the uh, styles into my application. 
So I'll just add that to the styles.css. I just copied and pasted this out of the getting started guide. Uh, now I'll inject the snack bar service by, uh, into our constructor. And that will give me the option to call things like snack bar dot open, which is the main command. And we'll just test this with a simple hello world. So as soon as our application opens, we should see a snack bar. Um, but if you don't add one of the dependencies of the Angular Material project is that you need uh, to install animations. And so let me show you what happens when you try this without animations. Uh, what you'll get is a runtime error that says, hey, you need to import either the no op animations module um, or actually supply the browser animations module. So if we take a look at the console, once this loads here, we're going to get a blank page. And when we pop open the dev tools and take a look at the console, we get this nice helpful error that says, please include browser animations module. So we're going to go back up and we're going to add that to our imports list. And then I'm going to import that uh, from platform browser slash animations. And once we have that, our ng serve should kick in here. Uh, the application should recompile uh, and we should see a nice snack bar pop up. There we have it at the bottom, hello world from a snack bar. So just that single snack bar open command has done this for us. So let's go ahead and move this up into our update available command. Uh, we'll update the message to say something a little bit better. Uh, and then we're also going to give it a second parameter. So by default, it's kind of a one way information delivery mechanism. Uh, but one of the things that we can do is uh, we can allow the user to refresh from the snack bar. So we'll tell them that an update is available and we'll give them the option to hit the refresh button uh, directly on our snack bar here. So we'll give them a reload option and then we're gonna save out uh, the snack bar that we're opening. And then we're going to call the on action method to get an observable of actions that a user has taken on it. And we will listen to that list. And so um, when we call this, uh, we'll do window.location.reload, which should then apply our service worker updates so that the user can both see uh, when a new update is available and then let the user act on that and make sure that they are seeing the freshest data that they want to be seeing. The next thing we're going to be doing is we're going to be using that push service, uh, the SW push service, and we're going to listen to the messages observable, and we're going to subscribe to that. Whenever a message comes in, we're going to console log this. And then because we already have the snack bar service, we can do something nice like um, we will just call snack bar dot open uh, and pass that same message out. Um, and in general, these messages are going to take the form of JSON. Um, and so I'm going to uh, JSON stringify this so that we have a uh, a message that we can read directly in the browser without having to worry about the kind of underlying data there. Uh, and then the last piece that we need to do to make push notifications work is we need to actually register for push. And so again, this is on the push or SW push service, we're going to call request subscription. And that takes a options object uh, with a server public key member, uh, which takes a string. So we'll just call that key for now. And then we actually have to go get that key. And then when we have a subscription successfully registered. What we want to do is we want to uh, get this out of the push subscription object that we're going to get back. And then we, I'm going to dump that out to the console. So normally you'd be propagating this back to your server because the keys that you're going to get and the endpoint you're going to get from the push notification registration uh, is what the server needs to send you push notifications. Um, but I'll just be manually copying and pasting this from my client application into a tool we're going to use. I found it very, very tough to figure out how to figure out these keys at first. Um, but fortunately today, I'm going to be telling you one way to generate these keys successfully. There's a, a really nice uh, GitHub repository called Web Push Libs. Uh, so this is one I, I highly recommend if you're getting started with this. And there's uh, a CLI that we can use if we don't want to build out a full server right now. So I'm going to go ahead and use Yarn to globally install the Web Push CLI. Uh, and then from this, there's two commands that we can run. The first is to generate keys, and the second is to send notifications. So uh, we're going to copy that. We're going to uh, run this command that's going to generate both a public and a private key for us. And this gives us our public key and our private key. Uh, and I'm going to need the public key right now because I'm going to save that into the push 
uh, registration. And then we're going to need both of those keys in a second. And so uh, one of the most complex parts about doing push notifications is that uh, you actually need to run a, a relatively complex command if you want to be um, sending those push notifications. And so the nice thing about this library is that uh, it has a big long command that you can send. Uh, and so we're just going to copy and paste that and we're going to fill in each of the variables that we need. And we don't actually need that last one. All right, so let's copy this, paste this into the terminal and let's start filling out the fields that we know. So we know our private key, so we'll just put that in quotes. Oops, copy and paste the wrong thing. Let's try again. Apparently the hardest part of this process is copying and pasting. All right, so we've got the private key. Uh, now let's go ahead and replace the public key. Again, just right from above. Uh, and these keys are in what's called Vapid format. Uh, I won't get into Vapid, um, but it's basically the standard that push notifications are used across browsers. Uh, Vapid subject is the kind of context of our push notification. So we're going to put our uh, localhost 8000 here. Uh, we can ignore TTL, we can ignore encoding because we're going to use the default one. Uh, payload. So you can send whatever you want, but the Angular service worker is expecting JSON. And so we'll just send a very simple JSON object here. So we'll say test hello world. Make sure we finish the quote there. And then for browser key and auth, uh, I'll just blank these out for now, but we're going to need to get these from the browser. These, these end up coming back as part of the registration of our, our request. So let's jump into the browser. Our uh, build should be done now. So we'll, we'll serve that up with Python again. Uh, again, any server will work. Use whatever you prefer. Uh, we'll hit refresh. It's not going to work because it's still using the old service worker. Um, so we'll, we can go to the application. We can unregister this, and we'll just get the latest version that is now registering correctly. And so because we emptied or dumped out all this data as JSON, we can just copy and paste it. So into our little command here, we've got the endpoint, and it's all properly quoted already by Chrome. And then we're going to copy this p256dh. That's the key that we're going to be using. And then finally, we will copy the auth section into the auth part of our command. And if we hit enter, this should send our push notification via the cloud uh, to our web application. And if we look at the console and our snack bar at the bottom, our JSON request came in perfectly. So that observable emitted a new value, the push.messages observable. Uh, and we got that out in a way that we could act on it. Uh, but there's another half of push notifications, which is what if we want to show a notification to the user? And so we support the full notification API, and it's going to depend entirely on whatever you want to send to the browser. And so what we'll do is we'll just create a very, very simple push notification uh, that's going to pop up on the user's system. And so there, there's just a couple of fields that we'll need to do this successfully. And so I'll open up this push notification. We'll modify the payload. We'll add a notification key to it. And then I'm going to paste in a title. This is a test body and then just body. And so these are two parameters that are standard as part of the push notification API. Uh, and you're not actually going to see them in our application because uh, I have two monitors and my push notifications are happening on the other monitor. So I, I apologize about that. Uh, but at this point, uh, we've now successfully sent a push notification. So we have this kind of server interaction with our web application. You can send as many of those as you want. You can automate this uh, either via, via the web push libs or any sort of command line you want. You can send rich notifications. Uh, and you can make sure that the user is always up to date with the latest version of your application via the service worker. So. Uh, these are some of the most powerful APIs that exist as part of building PWAs and as part of adding service workers to your Angular application. Uh, and the Angular service worker is doing a lot of the heavy lifting for you in terms of figuring out what the subscription should look like, figuring out how to uh, manage and send communications from the uh, client to the server or from the client to the uh, service worker and back. Uh, and so now you are uh, pretty much an expert in doing service workers with Angular. Uh, Hope you enjoyed this video. See you again in the next one.